So why do trees look like my hands? Why do waves move like my breath? What is going on here? What forces led to the creation of trees? And what forces led to the creation of hands? Are these two different stories? Or are they two plot lines of the same story? Where do trees come from? And where do hands come from? Let's take a step back and look at the story of how we all got here. And let's start at the very beginning, the earliest known event, the Big Bang. Where the energy of the Big Bang came from, we don't know. What a mystery. A Big Bang and then matter rushes apart, forming gigantic patterns, spreading, always spreading. And gravity acts, bringing these tendrils together to form galaxies and stars, connecting, always connecting. And planets form. And in the primordial ocean, atoms bump into each other and form molecules. So much jostling, spreading, and connecting. More complex molecules form, chains of amino acids spreading and connecting. Single-celled organisms are born, jostling, reaching, connecting. Multicellular organisms reaching, reaching, connecting. Then photosynthesis reaching for sunlight, each organism a tremendously complex network of life. DNA is copied, proteins are made, signals are sent, all of this done mindlessly, for there are not yet any brains. Mindless organisms reaching and connecting, reaching and connecting. The first nervous systems evolve in jellyfish to allow both movement and sensing the world. Neurons growing and connecting, growing and connecting. This proves handy. Neural networks uh, make limbs move, open the mouth, bring in food, sense predators. Systems grow by chance and survive if they help the creature to survive. And then concentrated neural networks, brains develop. To look at a brain up close is to see an incredible network of neurons interwoven and interspersed, created through chance mutations and reinforcement of success. So why do the neural networks in our brains look like trees and look like hands? It's because they all evolved to reach and connect, to reach and connect. We do not think using logic gates and rational processes. We think using what evolution gave us. There's a professor of neurology and named and anthropology named Melvin Connor, who wrote a book called The Tangled Web, Biological Constraints on the Human Spirit. Connor says that humans think in ways that help us to survive. We use motivated reasoning, not pure reasoning. And yes, surviving isn't the only thing. We are also motivated to be close in close relationship with others. And this also provides plenty of room for motivated reasoning. If our crops fail, should we blame ourselves, blame nature, or should we blame the settlement one valley over? Aha, let's blame the settlement one valley over and let's make things right by taking their crops for ourselves. That is motivated reasoning and it can help you to survive. Sometimes you forgive your friend for something when you wouldn't forgive your enemy. That's motivated reasoning. Melvin Connor says that this behavior is wired in. Perhaps you've seen a little kid who can justify taking the last cookie even though they've had their share. That is motivated reasoning. Evolutionary psychologist William von Hippel wrote a book called The Social Leap. He argues that humans adapted to be social animals. We find value in a shared worldview, 
even if the worldview is not true. Staying loyal to your political tribe can be more important than sussing out the truth. And it is not just the other political tribe who does this. Your tribe does it too. We are wired to fit in. We are wired to believe what it is convenient to believe. We are not wired to think rationally. So here is a short list of our cognitive biases. Agent detection, ambiguity effect, anchoring, anthropomorphism, attentional bias, attribute substitution, automation bias, availability heuristic, and I'm still only on the A's. And for the full list, you can look up cognitive biases, a uh, list of cognitive biases on Wikipedia. Humans have so many cognitive biases. We have some because they help us to survive and bond with our neighbor. We have some because our brains are made by trial and error. It can be so frustrating to see the mess people are making of their lives or see the mess people are making of the world due to irrational behavior. I just want to implore people, please do a better job of reasoning. I wonder if you ever feel that way reading the news, seeing how people respond to COVID and such. So let's actually turn this into a litany. I invite you to join in. Each time I say something, please say, please do a better job of reasoning. So here we go. When a politician ignores the science, please do a better job of reasoning. When someone on the internet is wrong, oh, please do a better job of reasoning. When global warming doesn't get addressed, it needs to be addressed, please do a better job of reasoning. When someone chooses hate instead of extending a hand, please do a better job of reasoning. There's more to it than reasoning, I know. When someone is only short-term thinking, please do a better job of reasoning. When a friend misinterprets your words or workmate, please do a better job of reasoning. And take a moment to insert your own thing here. What makes you want to say, please do a better job of reasoning? Okay, let's say it. Please do a better job of reasoning. And one last one aimed at yourself because we are all wired irrationally. Please do a better job of reasoning. I think. Therefore, I am probably making mistakes. But we try so hard to think better. Coming out of the dark ages, full of myth and provincialism, the enlightenment was a time of stepping back to try to see the bigger picture. It was a time of taking things apart to see what made them tick, to see how simple systems interacted so that we could then understand more complex systems. The scientific outlook, outlook gave us great gains such as abundant food, an understanding of hygiene, and now mRNA vaccines. And thanks to science, we get to see a photo of Earth from outer space. But we took reason too far. Many examples of the modern era um, being unreasonable in its use of reason. So I'll pick one. Designers of cities said, let's take out everything that's complex, create a grid of streets, rectangular buildings, make everything large because large is more efficient. We created cities that were easy to understand, but that made no sense. Jane Jacobs came along and said, we need cities that don't make sense. We need cities that develop organically, the way that trees and hands and brains develop. Reasoning better means opening up to the complexities of the world, seeing things as they are, not seeing things the way you want them to be, and not seeing things the way your tribe says they are. 
Bell Hooks said that the heart of justice is truth telling, seeing ourselves and the world the way it is rather than the way we want it to be. She says more than ever before, we as a society need to renew a commitment to truth telling. Truth telling is one of our commitments, but we have other commitments. We don't specialize only in reasoning better, but there is a group that does. The group formed around a website called Less Wrong. They say, we can't know if we are right, but we can try to be less wrong. Their goal is to do a better job of reasoning, to overcome their cognitive biases so that they can see the world as it is, not as they want it to be. And the less wrong community spawned a broader informal network of people that is sometimes called the rationalist community. They don't love the name because they recognize that they're not rationalist. Um, someone named Julia Galef started the Center for Applied Rationality to help people to think better. She has a background in statistics, which is a sound background for disciplined reasoning, but beware, it is possible to lie with statistics, even to yourself. Before starting the Center for Applied Rationality, Galef was a member of the New York City Skeptics, and perhaps there are skeptics here today. Galef wrote a book this year called The Scout Mindset, why some people see things clearly and others don't. She argues that some people have a scout mindset trying to get an accurate lay of the land while other people have a soldier mindset motivated to see not what is true, but what will help them to win. Scouts aspire to accurate reasoning. Soldiers are content with motivated reasoning. Galef started the Center for Applied Rationality with the hope that she could help people to become scouts, that she could help people to overcome their biases so that they could see and think more clearly. And the good news is that studying reasoning can help you to better see your cognitive biases. But the bad news is that when it comes to reducing your cognitive biases, Galef did not see the results she was hoping for. It turns out that improving your reasoning skills can make you better at justifying your beliefs, not better at overcoming your cognitive bias. Even professional scientists don't always know what they don't know. The physicist Richard Feynman would play a practical joke by convincing his colleagues of one thing and then immediately convincing them of the opposite thing. So very sneaky and humbling. We value reason, we affirm reason, we promote reason, and we aren't necessarily good at reasoning. So what are we to do? One thing that we do is create groups that can think better than individuals can think. A scientific approach has people looking at the same problem from different angles, checking each other's work, going beyond the limits of one mind, and consider us. Perhaps our intelligence as a congregation is greater than the sum of our individual intelligences. You can fool yourself some of the time, but it is hard to fool a community of truth seekers. So have a number of people in your life to run things by. Some who think similarly to you to help you get into the nuances, and some who think differently from you to help you to see your blind spots. Reason is bigger than us. Another way to deal with being bad at reasoning is to use shortcuts. Instead of fully reasoning out whether a dog is safe, given its breed and temperament, you can simply check if its tail is wagging. Instead of reasoning your way through the nutritional value of everything you eat, just check if you're eating a variety of healthy foods. These shortcuts don't provide proof, but they help us to avoid situations that are too complex for our reasoning ability. 
unfortunately, one way that some people avoid bad reasoning is to just do things the way that they have always been done. That's their shortcut. The reasoning here is that if you do things differently, you'll probably do things worse. There's something called the rationalist to traditionalist pipeline. It happens when a rationalist says, wow, I am bad at reasoning and I can't get better at reasoning. Um, so they lose their faith in their ability to reason and just dial back their use of reason. Some call themselves post-rationalist or post-rat, very trendy name. And rationalists who dial back their use of reason a lot, who mostly just do things the old way, now call themselves traditionalist or trad, very trendy name for uh, having new trends. So I agree that we can depend too exclusively on reason. And yes, sometimes it is better to just follow the tradition of having birthday cake on your birthday without overthinking it. But I say do not respond to the limits of reason by abandoning reason. Rather, buttress it with other ways of knowing. We are bigger than reason. One way of knowing is relationship. I cannot reason my way into knowing what is in your heart. I need to be in relationship with you. I can't reason my way into understanding First Nations needs. I need to be in relationship with First Nations. This is why so many congregations have Indigenous awareness groups. We understand that relationship is an important piece of the puzzle. Another way to complement your reason is to love. Wake up with the decision that today you are going to love the world. We are wired to be biased towards those we love, so love everybody. Love all beings. You might be biased in your reasoning, but at least you can tilt the bias towards helping all, especially love those who need it the most. The poet Elizabeth Tarbox says, love is so elusive and so precious and doesn't follow any rules. Reasoning can make us overvalue the explicit, the legible, the understood, Love can move you through the world the way trees, hands, and neurons move, reaching and connecting. We understand that there are limits to reason, but do not give up on reason. Broaden yourself to include reason, relationship, love, and more. It is the reasonable thing to do.